I'm going to discuss the principles of performing emergency peritoneal dialysis. There's a lot of material, so if you want to skip ahead, here are some helpful markers. Background. We do a lot of hemodialysis in the United States. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we've noticed that many more patients are showing up with new renal failure. When you combine this with other stresses to the healthcare system, you're in big trouble. An article in the Wall Street Journal actually mentioned that several patients in New York City died because they couldn't get timely access to hemodialysis. With the pandemic raging, this is probably going to keep happening. Is there an alternative? Yes! Peritoneal dialysis. In this very simplified view, you can see the peritoneal space in white and loops of bowel that are covered with and suspended by visceral peritoneal membrane. Peritoneal dialysis works by putting a sterile catheter into the abdomen and infusing dialysate into the peritoneal cavity. Looking a little closer, you can see the bowel lumen, the bowel wall, the visceral peritoneum over the bowel, and the dialysate right next to it. In this schematic, you can see how the blood supply of the intestinal wall is just adjacent to the dialysate, so close that diffusion can occur across the peritoneal membrane. So if your patient with renal failure is hyperkalemic and uremic and acidotic, these values will normalize with peritoneal dialysis. After equilibrium has been largely reached, you can drain the dialysate and then instill fresh dialysate to continue the process. No complicated machinery is needed. Objections. I am a very important administrator. You're not credentialed for this. We've never done it this way before. I can't find any reference to this in our guidelines. Don't cause trouble. This is just going to have to wait until the administration meeting next month. Why don't you try making some more phone calls instead? How unprofessional. You're going to get in trouble one way or another. A risky procedure like this could only be justified in a pandemic or a mass casualty when even more people are going to die if you don't try something new. Procedure. So your first step is to actually arrange your equipment because it's going to be different depending on what you have. At the most simple, you're going to need an IV bag, some IV tubing, and some type of sterile medical tubing that you're going to put inside the patient. And a way to connect them securely. This connection is really important and what you'll be able to make will depend on the equipment you have available. For example, you can shove the hub of some IV tubing or three-way stopcock into a Foley catheter. It fits really well, but you also have to tie something around it to make sure you don't have leaking fluid. This is important. Here's another system using an NG tube adapter, and it fits right onto the IV tubing really well, actually. And you can put the other end in some sterile NG tubing or even connect it to an IV tubing extension kit. I'm just showing a few possibilities here. There's a million ways to do this, but you have to have it in mind ahead of time. If you don't have any official peritoneal dialysate solution available, you're going to have to make some. One of the simplest recipes is one liter of lactated ringers with 30 ml of D50 dextrose. This will give you a buffered solution with a very low potassium, much lower than the patient's, with just over 1% dextrose for osmotic diuresis. If you need more diuresis, every additional 20 ml of D50 will add about 1% dextrose concentration. Another option is one liter of normal saline with one liter of D5W and 100 ml of sodium bicarbonate 8.4% solution. To any dialysate solution you create, you might want to add 500 units of heparin just to prevent clotting. For much more detailed information and additional recipes, I refer you to this awesome paper which I had nothing to do with. There are special peritoneal dialysis catheters, but let's assume you don't have that kind of equipment. You can use any type of sterile medical tubing. Pediatric chest tubes, IV extension tubing, Foley catheters, even NG tubes have been used. I recommend using sterile scissors to cut a few extra holes in your tubing so that dialysate can flow in and out more easily. Placing this tubing is a lot like doing the old school diagnostic peritoneal lavage. 
There are several techniques for doing it. I'm going to show a semi-open method, but all of them require generous local anesthesia and a sterile prep. So you can start by making a midline incision right at the linea alba, about one to two centimeters below the umbilicus, dissecting down to the peritoneum, carefully elevate the peritoneal membrane with sutures or pickups, and then introduce a needle with a little fluid to dissect the tissues and insert a wire using the modified Seldinger technique. Direct the wire towards the left lower quadrant. Gently dilate the aperture. Now you're going to introduce your sterile tubing, whatever it is, over the wire. If your tubing tends to buckle during placement, you can support it with a sterile swab like this. Put at least 10 centimeters of tubing into the peritoneal cavity towards the pelvis and make sure that any holes you cut are well within the abdominal cavity. You should give at least one dose of IV antibiotics to protect against peritonitis. Suture your tubing in place and then connect it to your dialysate that you've already made. Here's my high-tech simulated peritoneal cavity with intestines. Here's my simulated dialysate in an IV bag with some IV tubing running down to a three-way stopcock. And you can see that it's connected to a Foley catheter, which is going into the patient's peritoneum. I also have some waste tubing attached to the stopcock, which we'll use to remove the dialysate later. Start infusing by gravity. Here you can see the dialysate accumulating in the peritoneal cavity. Leave about 10% of the fluid in the IV bag to avoid introducing air. Allow the dialysate to dwell in the peritoneal cavity for two hours. Once time is up, then it's time to remove the dialysate. Some people say you should just put the IV bag on the ground and let the fluid drain back out by gravity. I didn't think it worked that well, so I just swapped out the IV tubing for a 60cc syringe and used the piston technique with the waste tubing I attached earlier. You won't get all the fluid back, but you can repeat the process over and over. This can buy your patient days of time to get to definitive hemodialysis instead of just having hours to live. Disclaimer. Like I said at the beginning, this video just shows the principles of emergency peritoneal dialysis. Of course you shouldn't go just by what I've shown here. Yes, it's going to be risky, but it's really not that difficult, especially compared to other procedures we do all the time, like intubations and central lines and chest tubes. So prepare a little ahead of time. Depending on where you work, consider talking with your general surgeons and renal associates about this kind of disaster scenario and maybe set up a provisional team approach. It's always better to have colleagues supporting you than doing something like this on your own, but I know you could do it.